Good morning, Salt Church. How is everybody? Amazing. Okay, listen, I hope you brought your thinking caps and that you put on your thinking caps today. Because for our first song, guess what? We have some audience participation. That's right. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to do a little tutorial super quickly. Go ahead and get up. Let's get prepared. So listen, we have not sung this song since last Easter. So it may be just, you know, collecting dust in your brains. But it's not hard to follow along. It's got that gospel flair to it. And at one point, we've got some declarations going on. We are going to have everybody up here on stage, just like our Lord, commanding us to get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Now, your job, you've got two words. The first word is, okay. There we go. We got one. Okay. No, I'm sorry. The first one is, hey. hey. Look at that. Oh, no. The first one is, hey, hey. The second one is, okay. So when we say, get up, get up, get up, you say, hey. When we say, get up out of that grave, you say, okay. let's try it. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Woo!
Lord yourself because Jesus himself is nonstop interceding on your behalf. But if you need prayer, if you need someone to lay hands on you and to pray with you, our prayer team is always over here to your right. Please go to them. Keep praying. Keep worshiping. Prayer is worship.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Jesus is calling. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So this, this last song, I also haven't done this one in a while. And it's very, very, I feel like it's very intimate and worshipful. Um, in the melody and the way it's presented, but the words are very powerful and they paint a picture of our God that sometimes is maybe not the most popular one to sing about or to preach about. But I, I love that, that for us, for the believers, it is gentle and it is delicate, but our God is a mighty defender and he is going before you and he is doing things for you in the, in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. That is what he is doing. He is going before you and fighting a battle against powers and principalities. The word says that. I think we think so much about the things of this world that are, that are hard. You know, marriage and jobs and all that stuff. But there's a whole spiritual battle being waged right now. And that is what this song is about.
something a little different this morning um it's palm sunday uh, hallelujah right amen triumphant entry of our savior and king um and uh we don't because we're a mobile church we don't get the opportunity to do a, a good friday service so we wanted to take the time and worship him today in communion in communion so you should have a communion cup here if y'all would just remain seated for a second in worship please please remain seated i'm sorry we're, we're, this is a little different. If y'all, everyone could stand up for just a minute and honor God in communion. Father, we are so thankful for the cross. We are so thankful for what you've done. It is finished. Those powerful words that you made on the cross. and Today we remember you. Today we take the opportunity to worship you as you met with your disciples that night before the crucifixion. And you said, I want you to do this. And as the Apostle Paul says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of our Lord. So today, Father, we honor you. We honor you in communion. He said to, to take the cup, or take the bread, rather. He took the bread at the table. He broke it. He passed it to his disciples. And he said, when you do this, remember my body. Remember it's going to be broken. Today we live on the other side of that. And we look back to the broken body of Jesus Christ. And we remember Him. We remember Him. By taking the bread. 
if you'll partake with me today in worship. It says, in the same manner he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant of my blood. This is a new blood. This is an everlasting covenant that will be shed for you, a lamb that will be shed for you on the cross. Today we remember back to the cross. We look back to the cross and we take the cup. Let's take it together and worship him today. Thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you. Church, let's just celebrate together the goodness of Jesus Christ. You died and you rose again, and we're entering into the Holy Week, Lord, and we want to remember you. Remember you, God. We thank you, Lord, for the body and for the blood. Amen. All right, guys. Now you can greet each other. <laughs> All right. Greet each other and let everyone. My name is Lisa Weinkoop. I have lived in Virginia Beach for almost 40 years. I'm a family chiropractor with my husband, Steve, and we have one son, Thomas, or as most of you probably know him as, TJ. Um, and I love any animal and every child. My conflict and struggle was that my son wouldn't stop inviting me. Um, no, I actually was raised Methodist, but I was the Methodist that was a part-time Christian who went to, went to Sunday school throughout my childhood. My parents were good. Um, it took me every Sunday to Sunday school. Um, but once I was old enough to not go, I chose not to. Um, and then I did attend Quaker meeting for worship for many years, but we really never went back to church after I was probably 16 or 18 years old. Um, didn't really see a need to. Felt like I had a personal relationship with Jesus already, and I prayed and I read the Bible, so I didn't feel like I needed church. So that actually was because of our son. He met someone through his gym who told him about salt, and he was going through some tough times, and she invited him and kept inviting him, and he finally attended, and then he did the same. He would invite us and invite us and invite us. And we just, we kept saying, no, we're good, we're good. Um, and then he invited us to Easter Sunday. And again, the part-time Christian was, okay, we'll go Christmas Eve, we'll go Easter Sunday. So we went, um, and that was our first time visiting Salt. Actually, yeah, there was, um, I really didn't plan on coming back. I thought it was just gonna be checking the box. Um, but I remember walking up to the door to, I think it was the FX Theater is what it was called, and um, Christina was standing there, and I'll never forget the hug, the smile and the hug. It just said, you're home. It just was, it was just the most welcoming, amazing welcome that I've ever received. And um, I barely got in the door and knew that I would be coming back. Um, but I loved the service, loved the worship service, and just knew that this was home for me. I 
I don't know that I can think of any one specific moment. There's been a lot of small moments that I knew that Jesus was talking to me and that I had surrendered. Um, many of them have been watching my son's walk with his, um, his relationship with God and watching him play um, drums with the worship team and knowing that as much as he hates to be in front of people, that's only because he loves God that much and that just was the most wonderful thing as a parent to see. Um, and it just filled me. And I knew that this was a relationship that was beyond anything I'd ever felt before. And I knew that I was always, always gonna submit to Jesus. I'm a whole lot more patient. Um, you know, we I think everybody has family issues. Everybody has troubles in their life. And I reacted a whole lot differently um, before I have, uh, before this relationship. Um, I think, what would Jesus do? I stop and I pray on things more. I would have never done that before. I would have reacted more than responded. Um, I'm just a much different person in many ways, but I think mostly um, I'm just a whole lot more patient. because I don't know what I'd be doing if my son hadn't continued to invite me. Just that I'm really grateful. Really grateful for the community and the family that I didn't know I needed. And I don't know what I would do without right anymore. And um, please, don't give up on people. If they said no or no thank you, keep inviting. And hopefully one day they say yes. Salt always makes a difference, and a little bit of salt goes a long way, amen? Um, just, uh, I really love this family. I really love this family. Um, I, 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 can I just expound on, <laughs> on you guys for a minute. I don't mean to embarrass you, Lisa. Uh, I don't even know if TJ is here today, so he, he's, I think they were they had a cold or something. I think, I think, and Steve as well. Steve and Lisa and TJ, just a wonderful family. And uh, because, T, yeah, and uh, TJ, okay, I remember when TJ first came in, I, he was so nervous. He didn't know what to expect. He had a nice little shirt on, you know, like it was buttoned up. And, and if you know TJ, he's, you know, he's a t-shirt and jeans guy, you know. Um, and he comes walking in, and I, I go introduce myself. He's just this really polite guy, and he comes in, and he just starts connecting. And, and uh, just, just, uh, just to watch him, uh, he gave his life to Jesus and just was really changed. It was just amazing, amazing through the, that, that, uh, that month he, when we first started coming. And, and, uh, and, and, it was, and then Lisa came. Lisa and Steve came on Easter one Sunday, and, and that was awesome. That was awesome to see them. But uh, not, not, only the, not only did Lisa start coming, uh, uh, from what I was told, and I don't know if this would embarrass Steve, but Steve was hard-headed. <laughs> That's what TJ's T. words. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was hard to get him to church. But finally, he, he, he connected with God, and his life was changed as well. So it started, it started with TJ just making the invite and making the invite and making the invite, making the invite. And that's your job. We, 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 ways to share the gospel. You may not know how to lead somebody to Christ, but you can invite them to church. It might be the most world-changing decision that you, someone can make. That one question could change somebody's life. And we've got lots of ways you could do that. Now, guys, you've got to get these out of here this week. <laughs> okay, this is the final week. Easter's next week. By the way, we're meeting at the Wyndham. So if you show up here, uh, we won't be here, okay? We're going to launch in the Wyndham. We're going to launch in the Wyndham. And we're actually going to remain there for a while, praise God. <laughs> and we're going to keep praying for our permanent location. We're, we're, still, we're still working towards that. But, um, but we've got these things called uh, cards. If you know what these are, they're like little things that you can, we don't do those anymore because we have, we have uh, phones and electronic devices, but these little pieces of paper you can carry around and they're real easy to invite people to church. So if you want to carry as many as you want, take them today, put them in businesses, hand them out to people, uh, this could change somebody's life. This could change somebody's life. Also, if you're more creative, we have peeps. 
Um, you want to invite your peeps? Invite your peeps, right? Um, and uh, my, my daughter is got, has got a ton of these, and she's carrying them to school, and she's inviting everybody. And uh, she's just handing them out like crazy. So if she could do that, you guys can do that too. And you could just, you could just, you could take a little ribbon, put around it, maybe a little, little note or whatever you want to do if you're that type of person, and just hand it out to somebody, give it to somebody, put it in somebody, your neighbor's mailbox if you're safe doing that or whatever it is, and just let them know that you love them and you'd love to see them in church. God has given us this opportunity to, this, this window of opportunity in more than any time of the year to invite somebody to church and they say yes because they'll come to church on Easter. So, so bring your family, bring your friends, bring everybody. Also, um, we, we have these signs here. So we've been handing these out for the last month. And if uh, we have some left, grab, uh, please grab them. We'll have to throw them away after this. Well, maybe not. We can probably use them again next year. But take them, take them, please. Get it out there. Get the word out. Let people know Easter at the Wyndham, at the Wyndham. And, we've got, and, and let them know that we've got things for the kids. The kids are going to have an egg hunt at the beach, a praise party. I don't know what that's going to look like, but my, my daughter's really excited about it. They've been, they've been doing the praise thing back there forever, and, we're gonna, and they have other activities and gifts and stuff like that. So there'll be something for the whole family, but an Easter egg hunt on the beach, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, I mean uh, yeah, yeah, they'll be a little bit sandy when they come out, but they're going to have a good time. So uh, we're, we're super excited about that. So invite your peeps. Invite everybody you can next week. Let's fill the house. Last week we had over 300 people at Easter. I want to see that again this year. Amen. See some lives come to Christ and find Jesus. All right. So we are in week three. Let me open up my pad here. We are in week three of our message series on the cross. So we're talking a lot about the cross. We just celebrated communion. It was about the cross. We're entering into Holy Week. It's about the cross and leading up to the cross. And we're looking at the last words of Jesus on the cross. Uh, There's a lot of last words of Jesus, seven last words, in fact. And uh, like I said last week, it was really, really hard to pick the ones I wanted to because I didn't have seven weeks to teach this, and I wish I could have crammed like two or three words in a week, but I've saved some of those for another time, so I'll come back to them maybe next year, right? Maybe we'll talk about the other, other words on the cross. And So we've been, we've been walking through this uh, med- meditating on the cross. Really, it's kind of a thinking back. Meditation is just a simple, I'm thinking about the cross. I'm, I'm, I'm going deep in my thoughts about what Christ did on the cross. And some of the most significant things about the cross can be found in Jesus' last words. His last words give us some idea of what it really means. So we looked at week one, and uh, we saw that he, uh, that, that he was forsaken. My God, my God, why, didn't you, why, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> why did you turn your back on me? Why aren't you here? And he was forsaken so that you wouldn't have to be forsaken. That you can eternally look upon the Father because the Father turned his back for just a minute on the Son of God. And we we looked at that. And and then we last week we we looked at his the the idea of forgiveness, forgiving. A real powerful subject. You know, Jesus was able to forgive the people who were putting him on the cross. Can we not forgive those? who just do less things to us, and that it's a prison, and that we hold on to that bitterness when we don't forgive. We looked at that last week. Um, But let's just go back for a second. Just, just, Just think about Jesus for a minute on the cross. He was brutally beaten. He was cut open like an animal, organs exposed, in pain and agony, looking up to the Father. Just, just think about that for a second. Reflect on that for a second. Just, I, I know it's brutal, but it is. That's what crucifixion is. That he actually went through horrific pain, a horrific event in order to save you, to give his life for you. And, and men, when men were at his worst, God was at his best at that moment. He was at his best. So we're going to look at a scripture here. Uh, another last word of Jesus in John 19, 28 through 30. And if you're following along, those of you online who aren't able to be here today, if you want to pull open the, the Bible app and, and, and pop that up and, 
and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that today. But um, we're going to look at, uh, or, or you can follow along, you know, we've got paper notes, guys, you're paper people, paper people. Okay, John, John 19, 28 through 30, here we go. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. The scripture was fulfilled at that point because if we look back in Psalm 69, 21, we see that uh, the, the fulfillment of the I am thirsty prophecy that they, they gave him vinegar to quench his thirst. So, so that's what that's saying there. And then it, and in 29, we roll to 29, it says, and, and a jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, but the sponge on a stalk of a hypus plant, and uh, they lifted it up to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible, it is finished. What that, and with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these last words that you left us, God. Pour into our hearts today. Pour into our spirits today. May your spirit be with us. Let not my mouth speak, but your Holy Spirit speak to the people today. As we meditate and think on the cross in these last words. Amen. Amen. So what does that mean? What, what does it is finished mean? Um, uh, we, when, we look at, when we look at the scripture, we see done. It, it, he says it's done. It is finished. It is done. I have completed it. The original Greek word means to end, to complete, to execute, to discharge debt. Teletestai. Telelestai. Teletestai, excuse me. <laughs> to telestai. To telestai. To telestai. If you look at Tetelestai, uh, you see it in three different ways. You see, uh, okay, it's used interchangeably. A servant returning to his master. I have finished. I have finished the task. Master, I have finished. I, I am through with the task. And then the second way it's used is a merchant declaring the debt is paid in full. And then the third way, way it's used is a priest examining a lamb for sacrifice. It would look over the lamb and determine whether that lamb was perfect to decide whether that lamb was, was redeemable enough or used to, to, to be a, a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus said to tell, uh, tell say it again, to tell us die. <laughs> I'm having a little problem this morning. <laughs> to tell us die. To tell us die, that, that original Greek word, it means it is finished, the assignment is done, and that very thing changed history. That very thing changed history. It is finished. What was finished? There were 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. Just a few of those prophecies I will share with you today um, that, uh, to show you that it is finished. First of all, darkness would befall the land in Amos. It was completed. Jesus would be rejected, Isaiah 53. He was betrayed in Psalms 41. He was beaten, Isaiah 53. He'd, uh, they spit on Jesus, Isaiah 50. He was pierced, he was wounded, he was bruised for our transgressions, Isaiah 53. And Psalm 22 says he was mocked. He was forsaken by his friends in Zechariah. He would pray for his persecution in Isaiah. He would be crucified among thieves, Isaiah 53. Soldiers would cast lots for his clothing in Psalm 22. N not one of his bones would be broken. It wasn't broken as we see in Scripture, Psalm 34. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in Psalm 22? And his hands and feet would be pierced, Psalm twenty two sixteen. And he had been given vinegar to drink, Psalm 68. All of these were fulfilled. It was the fulfillment. Not only that, Satan's plan was thwarted. That was fulfilled in that time. The debt was paid. Death lost its sting. God, Jesus rose from the dead, as we're going to celebrate next week, and everything was fulfilled according to the word of God. Nothing can be added. Jesus did everything that the Father did 
that sent him to do, and he said to the Father, it is finished. We have done it, God. We have done it, Father. We have finished the task. We have finished what you've called me to do. It is finished. Praise God that it is finished on Jesus' part. But it's not finished on our part. We, we, we haven't finished. In fact, we all have unfinished business. We all have unfinished business in this earth. If we are alive, we have unfinished business. If we are alive, there's some things that we need to do. There's some things that God has left us on this earth to do. So it is, it, it's not finished yet for us. Praise God, it's finished for Jesus. But it's not finished for us. In fact, Revelation 3, 1 and 2 says it like this. I know your deeds. This is him talking to the church. Jesus is talking to the church through uh, John the Apostle, through, through a vision. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So wake up. Wake up. Jesus is telling us to wake up. Strengthen the re- what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds Get this word, complete. You haven't completed the task. Your deeds are not complete in the sight of my God. There's more for us to do. It's not finished for us. I was just thinking about when I first experienced Jesus, um, and he, I, I, I gave my life, I committed my life to Jesus. I was so excited. I was so Excited about what he had done. I'd finally figured it out. I'd finally uh, connected with God in a way that I had never before. I wanted everybody to know about Jesus. I I was in my Bible. I was in the Word all the time. I was looking for opportunities. Have you ever met a new Christian like that? It's just so excited. Maybe some of you are like that. Praise God. Stay there, please. Right? And you you get excited. And you're going to be the next Billy Graham. And you're going to go out and save everybody, you know. God's got a powerful plan for my life. I see it now. I'm ready to go out. I want to change the world for Jesus. But then time comes in to play weeks and months and we tend to get lazy and I got lazy and I started seeing that there, there's there's a lot more to this flesh that needs to be worked out there, there was things that were not completed in me in my heart there was integrity issues. There were, there were things, there were deep sins in my life that began to come back up. It began to creep back in. And I realized, it isn't finished. What, what God has done in my life isn't finished. Yes, salvation is there for me. I am saved. But there's more that had to be done in my heart. And I remember when I was called to ministry, and I just had a hunger to, to go into ministry, but I knew I wasn't ready. I knew there was so much more for God to do in my heart, in my life. And I walked up to the front of this church that, that I was a part of, and I remember the elders and the deacons and, and these, these men and women of God just praying around me. And, and I, just, I, just, I remember crying out, I, I can't do this with this stuff in me. I can't do this unless God delivers me from some of these things that are in my life that have been rooted in my life for so long. Some dark places in my life. I knew that God had to bring me out of that in order to do what he had planned for me from the very beginning. So we prayed together and God just filled my heart and filled my life and, and through a process of time and through development and discipleship, God took me to new places and and, and, and praise God for people that can come around you and help you grow and pray for you and be with you and walk beside you and believe in you and believe that you're called to the thing that you know God has called you to. They walk beside you. But my unfinished business is that uh, my inward passion didn't match my, I mean, my outward passion didn't match my inward character. My outward passion, that thing I had on the outside that was so exciting and so alive, as this passage says, the, the thing that's so alive, you're alive, but inside of me, it didn't match up with my inward character. So what is your unfinished business is my question. We all have unfinished business. What is yours? Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe you need to forgive someone. Maybe you need to try to restore a relationship. Maybe God's been trying to lead you to do that, to restore something. Maybe it's something simple like, 
I plan to finish college. I, I plan to finish my education. I've been putting it off, and I know God's calling me to do that. Or, or I need to take better care of my body, amen? Uh, I, need to, I need to do better. I, maybe God has, has been trying to lead me to do something, and I'm too unhealthy to do it. And, and maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it's to share your faith with someone. Maybe this week you need to go out and share the gospel with somebody. Maybe that's what God has for you. Or you need to give something away. Maybe something's holding you back because it's an idol in your life. And you need to just let go of it and give it away. Get it, get it out of the way. Or maybe you, you just need to deal with, with the sin in your life. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you just haven't been able to conquer yet. We need to identify, first identify your unfinished business. Identify your unfinished business. In fact, there on your, on your note page, you can actually pull that out. And, and, and I want you to take some time, not, not just this morning, maybe it is this morning, but during the week, I want you to pray and ask God, what unfinished business do I have? Identify your unfinished business. Write it down. Pray about it. Seek God for it. And then the next thing you need to do is, is to make a commitment. Make a commitment. Make a commitment to God. A lot of people start, but, but few finish. <laughs> we, like the, the, the fin- we like the starting part. We get excited and we're motivated and we're rolling and we're doing whatever it is God's called us to do or even, even simple things in life, but few people finish. And you know what society says? Don't commit. Don't commit. Don't don't worry about committing. Don't commit to marriage. Don't commit to relationships. Don't commit to church. Don't commit to to your job. Leave your options open. It's good not to commit. Uh, Don't get tied down to that one thing because there's so many different things out there. So commitment's kind of out the window. But here's what 2 Corinthians 8.11 says. Paul says this, Now finish the work so that your eager willingness... Because we got a lot of eager willingness. We all have eager willingness. Let's, let, we're eager to do things. Eagerness by itself doesn't really do anything, though, does it? You can have eagerness all day long. You can be sincere about a lot of things, but until you complete it, it's just sincerity. Sincerely wrong in a lot of cases. You can be sincere and sincerely wrong, right? You can be sincere about anything. But he says, finish it so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Are you indecisive? Do you know that, that, that God has something for you? Do you know that God is leading you to a particular direction, but you're like, yes, no, yes, no, maybe, I don't know. Let your yes be yes and your no be yo. No, I cannot stand a maybe, okay? Maybe I'll pray about it. Like we love to say I pray about it, right? Oh, I'll pray about it. Just say no, just say no, it don't matter. I mean, I'm not going to be offended if you say no. Just let your yes be yes and no be yes. no. Poor, I mean, uh, God, man, he's, he's used for a lot of things that isn't even him. Well, I've been praying, you know, and, uh, well, I've been praying too. <laughs> we can all use that, right? I feel like, well, I feel too. Feelings <laughs> decide a lot of things. Maybe it's just, it's just lukewarm, okay? Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. I'm reminded of the story of Hernando Cortez. Some of you history nuts in here probably know um, this beautiful smile. Uh, I don't know why they never s- smiled back then. I mean, I mean, he's got, he's got a little bit of... <laughs> okay, this is getting off subject here. Let's <laughs> Welcome to Salt Church. Some of you are like visiting for the first time. Wow, I've never seen anything like this. People just. But in 1519, Hernando Cortez, if, if, you, if you know the story, commissioned by the emperor of Spain with uh, 11 ships and about 700 men to explore uh, the New World. And uh, as they entered into Veracruz to... Uh, to settle there and, and to go into that land in, in uh, Mexico, there was dissension among the people that were in, in the ships and in the armies and, and things like that. And what, what was happening is, is uh, there was fear. Some of it was fear. Some of it was just rebellion. Uh, some of it was, uh, uh, there's many different things going on depending on what history books you read. But 
they were, there was a lot of fear of what was ahead of them. And Cortez wanted to eliminate that fear. So he ordered his soldiers to go and burn the ships. When they landed, he ordered them to burn the ships so there would be no way they can retrieve and go and, be, be, and flee. Burn the ships. No turning back. Burn the ships. I remember that old hymn, uh, there, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. <laughs> I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. My question is, what are the ships in your life? What are keeping you from committing? What's keeping you moving forward? There might be something that's, oh, this comfort or this thing or this job or this money or this, or this idea or, or you know, it's, it's, it, I know it's hard. A commitment is hard. It's never easy. But in order to pursue what God has for us, uh, we have to think about those ships that may be getting away in the way of what God has for us. We see this in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was on his face. He was crying out to God. I, I can't even imagine what he was probably going through that night as he was facing his crucifixion. He knew exactly what was going to happen. It, it would have been easy just to, to bail. It would have been easy just to run. But Jesus was committed. In fact, he, he was such an agony his capillary, uh, capillary, excuse me, capillaries under his skin began to burst and, and blood began to flow off his forehead. That's how intense he was at this moment when he was praying. Because, and he said this, he said this, uh, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Father, take this cup from me if you can. Father, if, if anything can be done, can I just, I don't want to do this. I don't want to face this. This was God in, in, in human flesh. The human side, the man side of Jesus going through this. We say, well, he was God. No, he was fully man as well. And he was dealing with the agony of going through this. But he ended with, yet not my will, but your will be done. He stepped across the line of commitment. Are we willing to step across the line of commitment? Maybe you need to burn some of those ships in your life and begin to step across the line and say, yes, Lord, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm ready to go. I'm here, Lord. Lord, send me. I'm not saying no. I'm saying yes. I, you've been telling me all, uh, all my life. Maybe some of you are like, all my life you've been calling me to do this. All my life you've been saying go this direction, yet we, 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 we fail to do it because we lack commitment. We have those ships in our lives. What's keeping you from that which God has left you on this earth to complete? What is that? The second thing is, once we've identified and, and, and committed, the next thing we do is we've got to take the next step. Take the next step. Because it's easy to get overwhelmed by the big picture. When we're thinking about what God has for us, uh, and and, and in the, in, maybe he's given you a really big vision for something, but it seems like impossible to get there. Uh, the chasm is just far too wide to even get there. It seems impossible to even look that direction. But, but what God wants you to do right now is just take the next step. What is, what is the next step? You don't have to know the future. You don't know, have to know the end result. Every day we make decisions. God's will is walking Every day, taking steps every day. Little things, little decisions that we make every day is a part of God's plan. God's will. People ask me all the time, what's God's will for my life? I can't figure out God's will for my life. Well, what are you doing today? What small steps are you taking today? Galatians 5.25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You know, you can walk with the world. You can step with the world all day long. We can step in everything with the world. But stepping in the world is just exhausting, and it's overwhelming, and it doesn't make sense, and it just leaves you dry. But walking in the Spirit is refreshing. Walking in the Spirit gives you, gives you peace, and it gives you life. And it gives you energy. There's something about walking in the Spirit that's beautiful. And, and listen, you may not know what the next five steps are, but you know what the first step is. It's, it's little decisions every day that we need to make. It might be, I need to do this or I don't need to do that. Uh, let me step away from that sin. I don't want to go that route. I know what I need to do. For some of you, it might just be leaving something. something or Others of you, it might be putting something back in your life that you need. 
What is the next step? It's, it's baby steps. It really is that. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I love that scripture because when I think about it, the, the, the path is dark. <laughs> when you look into the future, when you look at the, the uh, plan or the vision that God has for your life, it's hard to see. Let's just be honest. I, I don't know it all. We, we can't know it all. It's impossible to know it all. But as I take steps, the lamp lights the path. If I take small steps, there's a light. Oop, okay, there's another light. Oop, I see that. And we walk that path, and it opens up doors for us. We don't always know what's ahead of us, but we know what's right in front of us. We can take small steps, baby steps. One of my favorite movies is What About Bob? Bill Murray. And, uh, <laughs> and one of my favorite scenes, you know, Bob... It, uh, Bill Murray's playing Bob, and Richard Dreyfus is playing this psychiatrist, and, and uh, he's a hypochondriac. And he, everything's terrible, and he's like wiping things off while he walks in. He's just a nervous wreck, and he's all over the place. And he comes in to see the psychiatrist that gives him a book called Baby Steps. So he's, he's taking baby steps to the door, you know, baby steps to the elevator. Wow, this works. Wow, look at this. I can, I can do it. Baby steps, just baby steps. Don't think about what's ahead of you. Just think about what's right in front of you. Not like I've got a table here. I can't, I can't see over there. I can't see back there, but I can see right here. Baby steps. And he, he took so many baby steps, he ended up baby stepping right into their vacation and not leaving. <laughs> and to his family <laughs> and everything, you know. So it, it's all about baby steps. It's all about it's all about baby steps. For me, I didn't know what God was calling me to this day, like specifically. When I was called to ministry, it wasn't like, oh, man, you know what? I'm going to plant a church in Virginia Beach, and it's going to launch this day, and we're going to do this, and then we're going to go through this, and then we're going to come back to this, and then we're going to be here and be there, and we're going to move seven times during a pandemic. I didn't know any of that stuff. I think I would have quit real easily if I had known that. I would have. But what I did know is that God had called me to ministry. I took baby steps. Stepped into my local church. Began to serve in my local church. That's a baby step. I got this, this available. I got this gift. I've, I've got this teaching gift. I, I, can, I can teach. I can, I can lead. I can, I can put things together. I have a music gift. I can do this. I, I, that, that, that's a baby step. And from there, mentorship and fellowship and people approving and confirming my ministry calling. I decided to fill out applications for seminary, for graduate school, and could have gone anywhere, but baby steps. Led me to Virginia Beach, to Regent University. <laughs> baby steps. At Regent University, met my wife. Baby steps, all right? Got married, served in the church, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. It's right in front of you. Your, the will of God is right there in front of you. People say, what is the will of God for my life? What do you have in front of you? What do you have available right now to give God? Aim at that first, and God will begin to light the path to everything else. What's your next step? What is your next step? Maybe your next step is just to read a book. <laughs> Maybe you need to get down and, and, and sit somewhere and read something about what you're trying to do. Maybe it's getting a mentor in your life. Maybe you're without a mentor. Maybe you don't have anybody to speak into your life. Or maybe, maybe you need to write that letter that you've been planning to write to this person that you want to forgive. Maybe that's your baby step. Maybe it's making an appointment with someone. You, you've been struggling with something for a long time. Maybe that, that's it. Maybe, maybe a doctor or a psychiatrist or psychologist. Or, or maybe you need, need to put together a resume. Maybe it's time. You've been stuck for a long time in the same place you've always been. You know, it starts with a resume. Put a resume together. Put it out there, right? Or you want to apply to graduate school or you have a tough conversation with somebody. Maybe you, you've been meaning to do that for a while, to have that tough conversation with somebody that you really love. Baby steps. Or... Or maybe you just need to cut up your credit cards because you're spending too much money. Maybe that's a baby step for you. Or maybe you need, you need to confess. Maybe there's a sin you need to confess in your life. 
Maybe you need to pull some people together and say, Here, here's what's going on. Call a family meeting. Call a, and say, hey, here's where I am. This is where it has to start. Baby steps. Maybe your next step is making a decision today for the first time to follow Jesus. Maybe that's the baby step you want to make today. Paul says in Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He carries it on to completion. No matter what we go through, no matter what we have to face, we know that God will always bring us through and it should give us a passion in our hearts to follow God when we see what he's done and what he sent us to do. In 1968, in the Mexico City Olympics, John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania fell and cut his knee severely and dislocated his joints. 56 other runners finished the race, a 26.2-mile marathon race in the Olympics. Everybody had left him behind. He, he, was, he was by himself. Could have been easy to say, well, I quit. But he continued to go. And an hour later, after most people had left the stands, John Stephen comes running in. One hour later, this courageous runner entered the stadium. Though most of the fans had left the stadium, there he was to finish the race. And when they asked him, how, how did you do that? When they asked him, why, why did you continue this race? He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race, but to finish it. God did not send you here on this earth to start a race. He sent you on this earth to finish it. We are called to finish a race. Race. We commit, we take the next step, and we finish the race that God has called us to do. Acts 20, 24 says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. Paul's saying, I consider my life worth nothing to me, but only that I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we are living, God is not through with us people. God has a plan for our lives to share and testify of his goodness. If we're not dead, we are still in work with him. Finish the race. Run the race. Run the race. If you are alive... Run the race. Commit. Take the next step. And finish. The cross provides us with those last words. It is finished. The race you may be running today may be hard. <laughs> may be difficult. In fact, it is difficult. None of us have necessarily an easy race. But it's the best race. The cross gives us the best race possible. Because when you're in step with the world, it will drain you. But when you're in step with Jesus, everything is available for you. Everything. It is finished. Perhaps some of you here today have some unfinished business. I want to let you know that Jesus is here to walk you through that unfinished business. And our hope, my hope, is that one day, as I, as I walk this life and as I do what God's called me to do, and some days it's not easy, guys. Most days it's not easy. Most days it's very, very difficult. <laughs> Just to be honest, Jesus said, uh, in this life you'll have trouble. I mean, I'm sorry, you're just going to have trouble. I love how the series, if you, watch, if you follow... Uh, the series the chosen he says are you ready for hard things are you ready for hard things the li life the, the life isn't always easy but man it is way better with jesus it's way better to finish right and i hope that one day as i walk this life and i go through this that i can look at look at god and god just looks at me well done my good and faithful servant you have finished the race 
You have done well. You have done well. God's looking down on us. He's like, you're doing well. You're doing well. Know that there's a God cheering you on, cheering you through the race. When you're, when you're running like John Stephen and your, your leg's broken and it's all over the place, yeah, you're, you're, still, you're still rolling. Jesus, I want you to picture Jesus for a minute, stumbling, holding the cross. And if you have an opportunity, go back to the Passion of the Christ. Watch that again if you haven't in a while. I know every one of you probably have. But as he stumbled and as he just kept picking up the cross, he just said, I'll take that next step. I'm taking that next step to Calvary. When to put the vinegar in his mouth, I'm taking that next step into eternity. He kept taking that next step. Tripped and fell. He was pierced. I'm taking that next step. They spat on him, accused him, mocked him. Father, forgive them. I'm taking that next step. The cross is all about next steps so that we could have eternal life and begin to take steps to what God has for us as well. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the cross as, as we've studied the cross. We pray, God, that we wouldn't take you for granted, Lord. We wouldn't take our faith for granted, Lord. We wouldn't take eternal life for granted, Lord, but that we would see that what you did was finished, that everything was completed, every prophecy was, was met. You finish the work, Lord. Give us a heart and passion also to finish the work, God. That we would commit to you, Lord. No turning back, Lord. We're walking towards you. No turning back, Lord. I'm letting go of my ships. No, no more of this holding me back, Lord. I want, to, I want everything that you have for me, Lord, I completely commit today, Lord. And I'm going to take the next step. Take those steps. And I'm going to finish. Lord, we want to finish. We want to finish well. We want to make our Father proud. We want our Father to stand before us in heaven and say, Good, I've done my good and faithful servant. Lord, we pray, God, that we would remember. And for some today, as we continue to pray, maybe your first step today, maybe your commitment today is to make a decision for Jesus. If that's you would, would you, would you make that decision? Would you give God an opportunity to change your life? Would you give God an opportunity to transform you? Would you give God an opportunity to show you what real life is all about? If you would do that, if, you, if that's you today, won't you pray this with me and everybody here can Pray along with me. Father, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sin. I'm far away from you, Lord. Today, come into my life. Come into my heart. I believe that you died and you rose again. Change me from the inside out. I make a commitment to you today, and I'm going to walk these steps out with you into eternity. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Leon. I don't know about you, but all of the taking the next step made me think of Frozen 2, doing the next right thing. So if you were not... Thinking of what about Bob? Maybe you were thinking of Frozen. Thank you, Pastor Leon, for doing the next right thing. Speaking of, how about that handsome bassist this morning? Woo! So it's just a good-looking crew up here. Um, and for anybody who is wondering, Carolina did win yesterday. So did Tennessee. So we have smiles. We may be tired. No promises about next week. You'll just, you know, 
go easy if they don't keep making it through. Thank you everybody so much for being here. Please don't forget to grab your signs, your peeps, your cards, pass them out, invite people to Easter. It's such a great opportunity to minister to people who would not normally go to church. And let's show them what they can expect when they come into a true church community, a true family. Just welcome them in, just like Lisa said earlier. Welcome them in. Give them a hug. This is our opportunity. We don't pass around buckets or anything, but there is a time of giving. If you would like to, you can support Salt Church. If you are brand new and a guest, we just thank you so much for being here. Don't feel compelled to give at all. If you're a regular attender, you see the ways that you can't whoop, the ways that you can give. It's just muscle memory, you know. Um, on the screen, you can text to give. You can put something in the box. You can mail something in, um, and you can give securely via the Church Center app. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your support. We love you, and we'll see you next week.